In the seven years we've been bringing you these biographies and music, all the subjects have been artists who were members of the Metropolitan Opera Company, except one. You already know the name. Mary Garden sang a number of times at the Metropolitan Opera House, but never as a member of the company. It was always as prima donna of the organization that later became the Chicago Opera. Before that, she held forth as a reigning star of Oscar Hammerstein's troupe at the Manhattan Opera House, and afterward at the Lexington Opera House during the annual visits of the Chicago Opera. When queried as to why she never sang with the Metropolitan, her answer was, as her answers always were, direct, frank, and simple. I was never asked. In her repertoire, particularly the modern French works, she had no rival. For one so dynamic and straightforward, Mary Garden presented a number of contradictions. She was born in Scotland, preferred to live in France, but was as American as Chicagoan as Jane Addams or Carl Sandburg. The critics delighted in shortchanging her voice. Hunica referred to her as a sonorous mirage, yet she's one of the legendary figures of opera. She enjoyed quite a high reputation as a femme fatale, yet an expert would be hard put to name one of her lovers and try to reconcile the legend with this flat statement in her autobiography. I'm certain I never loved anyone in my life. And she ends the book, which by the way, was written in collaboration with our old friend Louis Biancoli. My music always came first. My passion was opera, and that was the only real romance of my life. She came to America as a child with her father and mother and sisters, and the family settled in Chicago. Her musical gifts showed themselves early, and her teacher found her a sponsor who sent her to Paris for further study. After about a year and a half, the monthly payment checks stopped. Mary's teachers wouldn't dream of letting her go merely because she couldn't pay, but there was still the matter of room and board, however modest the pension. Incidentally, Miss Garden's father later paid back every cent her sponsors had advanced, a sum between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars. It was November. The leaves were falling. In desperation, Mary had gone for a walk in the Bois. A lady walked by. It was Sybil Sanderson, the American singer for whom Massenet had written Thais. Mary sobbed out her story, and Sybil Sanderson made her come home with her for lunch, and that very afternoon moved her into a room in her own luxurious apartment. Two months later, Sanderson invited Albert Carré, the director of the Opera Comique, to dinner to meet her protégé. Monsieur Carré in turn invited them to come next day to the rehearsal of a new work he was preparing for its world premiere, Charpentier's Louise. Before she left the theater, Carré had given Mary the score of Louise to study. From that day, Miss Garden says, I spent every waking hour studying the score by myself. She saw and heard nearly every performance and would then go home and act out every bit of the stage business alone in her room. One day, there was an emergency call from the comique. I believe you told me, Monsieur Carré said, that you know Louise. Every note, every step, Mary answered. Now listen carefully, he went on. I may need you tonight. Mademoiselle Rioton, the young lady who created the part, is ill. Will you help me out? Are you certain you can do it? Her reply, your orchestra could be playing the Marseillaise, and I would still sing Louise. Here's your ticket. Be back at 7.30 and don't move from that seat until the final curtain. I hope you're not superstitious. The number of the seat, 113, and the day, April 13th, 1900. Sure enough, in the intermission before the third act, an attendant came looking for the occupant of 113. The conductor wanted to stop the performance and refund the people's money, but Carrie stood his ground. The major difficulty seems to have been to find a costume small enough for Mary Garden, who at that time weighed only 98 pounds. 
Incidentally, the last time she was here, she still weighed 98 pounds. She told me she hadn't eaten dinner for 30 years. Tea and toast at six o'clock, and after the performance, instead of suppers of lobster and champagne, she had a glass of hot milk with 10 drops of iodine in it. But back to Louise. It was Hamlet who said, the readiness is all. When it was almost time to begin Dupuis Le Jour, Miss Garden recalls, I turned my back to the audience and walked up the stage looking at Paris. Now's your chance, I said to myself. And I came back and put myself behind the chair where I had to sing that beautiful aria and sang it as if I'd been on the stage for a hundred years. Mary Garden remained at the Comique for eight years and sang Louise there 100 times. At this point in her autobiography, she sums up her career. I began at the top, I stayed at the top, and I left at the top. Her next triumph came only two years later, the world premiere of Pelias and Melisande. Forget your singers, Debussy told his cast, and in the 30 years she sang the part, Mary Garden never took a curtain call as Melisande. You see, she said, as Melisande, I really died. With tears in his eyes, Debussy said of her, there's nothing I can tell her. Everything she does is right. The next record we're going to play was made in 1904, two years after the world premiere of Pelias. It's the tower scene, and Claude Debussy himself is at the piano. You remember it's the moment when Melisande lets her hair fall from the window. And what hair? The story is that Miss Garden's Melisande wig came from a Brittany girl who sold her golden tresses to make up her dowry. It was Mary Garden and Claude Debussy in the tower scene from Pelias and Melisande. We'll be back at the third intermission. <laughs> 